And with the lab you just turned in yesterday, do you remember some of the differences between ionic and covalent? Uh -huh. I don't know, like what kinds of conclusions did you come up with from your lab? Um, I don't know, maybe more specifically, like, what kind of compounds have really high boiling or melting points? Ionic. Definitely ionic. Ionic. And so if a compound has high melting and boiling points, what could you say about the strength of the bonds holding it together? Most likely uh, very strong. They're strong ionic bonds. Strong ionic bonds. Good. So <clears throat> because it takes more energy to break them, they're stronger. So ionic bonds are stronger than covalent bonds. Covalent bonds, there's kind of a range of them. Remember we talked about nonpolar and polar covalent, and we found that by finding the difference in electronegativity from that table, and then looking at what the difference was, and you called it nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. Okay, so kind of on that idea, but not exactly the same. We're focusing only on, on covalent compounds today, and we're going to draw Lewis structures for them. And to do a Lewis structure, you first need to know about valence electrons. So if you look over here, do you guys remember what a valence electron is? We talked about it not a ton, but a while ago. When we were doing like electron configurations, what was that, Kathy? Yeah, so you know how like with your electron configurations, you start at the innermost energy level and then you go outward, outward, outward? Well, whatever electrons are in that outermost energy level, those are your valence electrons. And if you look at all of these elements, we can say how many they have, and the, the tool that'll help you with that is the periodic table. So with hydrogen, how many electrons does hydrogen have? One. It only has one electron, so that is a valence electron. And remember we did those dot diagrams a long time ago with those? How about fluorine? How many valence electrons does fluorine have? Yeah, we'll just wipe that off. I think, let's see. It has nine total electrons because it has nine protons, but how many valence electrons does three. it have? Less, or no, more than three, sorry. Five. More than five? Seven. That's definitely six. Seven is correct. How do you get seven valence electrons for fluorine? One of less than that. So you're thinking of orbital <laughs> diagrams. That's good. Um, how did you, you said seven, right, Jay? Yeah. How did you get seven? I think I heard you said one, add one and you get eight, right? Yeah. Did you say that? Yeah. Okay, so what? what's the importance of eight? That's, um, that's full rate. Yeah, if you look at the periodic table, remember um, when, when atoms form ions, like the fluoride ion, it gains one electron and then it becomes F with a negative one charge? Well, it gains one electron because that gets it to the noble gas configuration, which means it has eight electrons in its outer orbital. So if, if fluorine only has to gain one in order to get the noble gas configuration of eight, it must have seven, okay? So then if you did the dot diagram, remember you do like one dot on each side and then you just pair them up when you can. Um, how about phosphorus? Looking at the periodic table, how many valence electrons do you think phosphorus has? Three. There is something with three, right? It gets a negative three charge when it's an ion. So how many valence electrons would it have? Four. You're adding three electrons to get the full valence shell because we know it has a negative three charge on the ion. So it must have had five. So there's actually an easier way than thinking about the charges and working backwards like that. Look at calcium. Think of that one. And then I'll tell you if you haven't noticed the pattern already. Uh, uh, You're on the right track, though. Wait, for what? Calcium. How many valence electrons does calcium have? Two. Two. Sulfur, what do we think for sulfur? Uh, six. Sulfur has six, good. How about oxygen? Uh, six. Six, exactly. So let me tell you, and then we'll do the last column together with the pattern. If you look at how many valence electrons each of these have, 
it is how many it has in its outer shell. You can figure it out by doing the electron configuration if you want. So 1s1, this is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, and we don't care about the inner level, but the outer level, the second shell, 2 plus 5 gives you 7. That's the hard way to do it. The easy way is look at what group it's in. Look at the Roman numeral in front of the group A. So look at all the tall columns. Whichever tall group it's in from the left, that's how many it has. So like hydrogen is in group 1A, so it has one valence electron. Fluorine is in group 7A, so the BIIA, it has seven valence electrons. Phosphorus is in group 5A, has five. Calcium's in group 2A, it has two. Sulfur is in group 6A, or the sixth tall column over, so it has six, same for oxygen. So if you do that, then how many valence electrons would carbon have? Four. Yeah, it's in group 4A. So it looks like this, right? Group 4A. It's the fourth tall column over. Now we're kind of skipping over the short columns because the transition metals have those complicated electron configurations with the D elements and stuff like that. So it doesn't really work for that, but look for the A columns that you're focusing on there. Aluminum, what would that be? Yeah, AL is in group 3A, so it has 3. in group 3A. And then sodium. One. One, exactly. So I guess I should put the dot in. Okay, so we have done those kinds of things before with these dot diagrams. What we're going to do today is not just do one element symbol with its dots for its valence electrons, but we're going to do Lewis structures for molecules of covalent compounds where you stick some together but the first step is figuring out how many valence electrons each has, okay? So if you do not already have a whiteboard and marker at your table, go ahead and grab one. I also want you to grab your notebook up because I'd like you to have at least one or two complete examples written down too, and then we'll start up there. electrons with E with a little negative sign, so it's just less writing. So the atomic symbol represents the nucleus and the inner shell electrons, and then the valence electrons are represented by dots. And so that's like those examples over there, like when we say phosphorus is this symbol. The P represents the nucleus and any inner shell electrons, and then the five dots on the outside would be the five valence electrons. But we're going to combine that with other ones to make compound Lewis structures in just a few minutes. And then just to remember what a valence electron is, that's just an electron in the outermost energy level. available for bonding. Those inner shell electrons are there because it helps make up the structure of the atom itself, 
and keeps the atom neutral, but only the far from the nucleus electrons, the valence electrons, are available for bonding. And again, in an ionic bond, what happens with those valence electrons? Or in a covalent bond, what happens? They're shared. In a covalent, they're shared, good. And then in ionic, it's just a transfer. So we're only talking about like which electrons are shared today. Electrons between two atoms are, are shared in these covalent bonds that we're drawing structures for. So a single bond, and then similarly there are double and triple bonds, but a single bond is just a covalent bond in which one pair of electrons is shared. probably have multiple different bonds in a molecule, but between any two atoms, if they share one pair of electrons, it's a single bond. Sometimes they'll share two pairs, that's a double bond, three pairs would be a triple bond. And you don't talk about single, double, and triple bonds with ionic substances, it's just with covalent, because it's talking about sharing. And the last little definition before we get into some samples would be an unshared pair, also known as a lone pair. It's, it's just a pair of valence electrons that's not involved in bonding. So, if you have your valence electrons all figured out, and you'll see an example in a minute, mean, it'll make sense, but if you have your valence electrons figured out, and some of them are involved in a single bond, maybe some are involved in a double bond, but maybe some of them are there, but they're not involved in a bond at all. They're still important to write down and mark because it can actually help determine if it will bond to something else eventually, or more importantly, it helps determine the shape of the molecule. So next week we're going to talk about Vesper theory, it's called, and you can predict what shape a molecule actually has to, whether it's linear or bent or tetrahedral. <laughs> okay, so just a few definitions so you know what I'm talking about. Now. electrons make an atom stable? Eight. Eight, for the most part, right? So this is called the octet rule. Most atoms want eight electrons in its outer shell. Now I say most because there are some exceptions. Sulfur, or actually anything beyond sodium, can at some points become what's called hypervalent, and it can actually hold more than eight valence electrons. Sometimes, like sulfur, can have like ten or twelve valence electrons around it. But most of the time, they want eight. And I'm not going to give you any weird exceptions unless I talk you through it first. The only other exception to keep in mind is hydrogen does not want eight. How many does hydrogen want? Two. Why does hydrogen only want two valence electrons? It's the first element, right? It's in that first period of the periodic table. How many electrons can fit in the first energy level? Just two. So it's small atom, only one energy level, only holds two. So hydrogen, because it can only hold two valence electrons, that's going to tell you a lot about the structure of some different molecules. Hydrogen will like almost never be the central atom of a molecule, because the central atom has to have a lot of stuff bonded to it. And it generally only forms one bond. You won't see like double or triple bonds with hydrogen. So that's kind of important right there. Um, I think boron and beryllium are some other examples that 
don't need eight valence electrons, they'll have like six. 